Hello. Hello. Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Kate, I'm a sophomore studying history and literature at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please take a moment to note the exit doors which are located on the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. Um, in the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Um, now please take a moment to silence your cell phones and um, take your seats and join me in a round of applause for the Dean and Don K. Price Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, Doug Elmendorf. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted to kick off today's discussion about strengthening the US safety net our guest speaker, Bob Greenstein, will offer remarks shortly, and then we'll be in conversation with one of our faculty members, Jason Furman, and with all of you. Let me start with a few words about this event. The Edwin L. Godkin Lecture was established at Harvard in 1903 and honors Edwin Godkin, who was a 19th century American journalist who founded the political and cultural magazine, The Nation, and was editor-in-chief of the New York Evening Post. Charles William Eliot, then president of Harvard, introduced the inaugural Godkin Lecture by praising Godkin's, quote, remarkable vigor and great candor and unremitting devotion to lofty ideals of public duty, unquote. The theme of this lecture series has been, quote, the essentials of free government and the duties of the citizen. And over the past 120 years, many distinguished public leaders have spoken at Harvard in this lecture. Recent speakers have included our alumnus, Brian Stevenson, who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, Eric Holder, then former Attorney General, Jeb Bush, then former Governor of Florida, and Gina Raimondo, then Governor of Rhode Island and now US Secretary of Commerce. Today, we are very fortunate that our distinguished speaker is Bob Greenstein. Four decades ago, Bob founded the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities which quickly became one of the most important non-governmental institutions in Washington, DC. He led the center until a few years ago when he stepped down and became a visiting fellow in economic studies at Brookings. Bob is one of the most foremost experts on the US government budget and a range of policy issues, with an emphasis on programs affecting people with low or moderate income. Bob is known not only for his unbelievably extensive knowledge, but also for his deep and abiding commitment to fair and effective safety net policies. In addition to creating and leading the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities for so long, Bob has lent his knowledge and commitment in different ways at the request of President Carter, President Clinton, and President Obama. Bob is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has uh, been honored with a MacArthur Fellowship and received the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Prize from the American Academy of Political and Social Science, among many other awards. After Bob gives his address, he will be joined in conversation moderated by Jason Furman. Jason was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Obama and is now the Aetna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy here at the Kennedy School. Um, I will just note uh, uh, personally that I've known Bob and Jason uh, for decades, and I have learned a tremendous amount from both of them. Uh, we are in for an exceptional evening. Please join me in welcoming Bob Greenstein. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that very generous introduction. Thanks to the Kennedy School for hosting this event, and thanks to all of you for coming. You know, I first learned of the Godkin Lecture a few blocks from here in Greeno Hall as a freshman when a professor assigned a past Godkin Lecture, and of course I was taken. I never imagined that decades later I would be delivering a Godkin Lecture. I am both humbled and honored to be here with you tonight. Let me begin with a well-known but disturbing fact. 
The United States has unusually high levels of poverty and disadvantage for a Western industrialized nation. I'm going to use my time here tonight to examine how different types of social programs have done in the political arena and how that might inform efforts to strengthen social programs so we make more progress in reducing poverty and raising living standards for millions of people. The ongoing debate over social programs has been shaped in part by a long-standing narrative which holds that social programs that are targeted, that go only to people below certain income levels, almost inevitably do poorly in the political process and are cut or eliminated over time. Uh, there's an old adage you may have heard of, programs for the poor are poor programs. The narrative also holds that universal programs, those that go all the way to the top of the income scale, do much better in the political sphere. Tonight, I'm going to cover three related issues. One, is that narrative accurate? Two, what other factors help to explain social programs' weaknesses or strengths? And third, several other issues related to universal and targeted programs. How well do they do in reducing poverty? How well do they do in actually reaching and serving the people who are eligible for them? Okay, and then Jason and I will discuss the policy implications and we'll go to your questions. Let's start with a narrative about targeted and universal programs. In a paper I'm now completing, I look at U.S. social programs over the 40 years from 1979 to 2019, and particularly at what we call mandatory or entitlement programs, which most of the major benefit programs are. The mandatory programs that are targeted consist mainly of SNAP, which we used to call food stamps, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, Child Nutrition Programs, SSI, the Supplemental Security Income Program for low-income people who are elderly or have disabilities, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, the Child Care Entitlement to States, the Earned Income Tax Credit, or EITC, the Low Income Part of the Child Tax Credit, or CTC, and the Affordable Care Act's Tax Credit subsidies to help people afford insurance. Contrary to the conventional wisdom, the targeted mandatory programs have grown faster and expanded more in recent decades than the universal ones. Budget data that Richard Kogan of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities has compiled show that from 1979 to 2019, could I have the first slide please? That from 1979 to 2019, the targeted mandatory programs grew at an average rate of 3.4% per year after adjusting for inflation and growth in the U.S. population, while the three main universal programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Employment Insurance, grew at an average rate of 2.4% a year, nearly a third less. Looked at another way, targeted mandatory programs grew 281% over this 40-year period after adjusting for inflation and population, and they grew significantly as a share, as a percentage of total mandatory spending, while the three universal programs grew at a slower 155% rate over this period, and their share of overall mandatory spending was unchanged. 1979 and 2019 are good comparison years. They're both peak years of an economic recovery. But if I start in the 1960s instead of 1979, the story is essentially the same. Now, to be clear, not all targeted programs did that well, nor all universal programs either. There are huge differences within each of the two program categories. Among the targeted programs, Medicaid and CHIP grew more than 10 times between 1979 and 2019 in inflation-adjusted terms. SNAP nearly tripled both in real federal spending and in the number of beneficiaries. The EITC grew from a tax credit providing benefits to about 7 million households in 1979 to one serving about 27 million in 2019 and providing significantly larger benefits. However, targeted programs that deliver cash aid to people who are not elderly or disabled, programs often referred to as welfare, did extremely poorly. They were cut severely. There are 
also large differences among the universal programs. Social Security and Medicare grew strongly, mainly due to the aging of the population. But unemployment insurance was cut at the federal level in the 80s, at the state level, especially in years, the last decade, years since the Great Recession. And I find this figure kind of amazing. But in every year from 2011 through 2019, fewer than 30% of the unemployed received benefits in an average month, which is many fewer than several decades ago. Many of the unemployed actually are ineligible for unemployment insurance. So when it comes to targeted and universal programs, what we find is that the differences in how the programs have done politically over recent decades are greater within each of the two categories than between the two categories. And on a related front, there's another mistaken belief that underlies the flawed narrative a belief that targeted programs were cut sharply in the Reagan years and the 1996 welfare law and never recovered, while Social Security basically went untouched. That simply is not so. Medicaid, SNAP, and other targeted programs were cut in 1981 and 1982. But a number of the key cuts expired by the mid-1980s, and policymakers then expanded the programs quite a bit. From 1984 through 1990, that means under Presidents Reagan and Bush one, policymakers expanded Medicaid, SNAP, or both in every year. Before the mid-80s, Medicaid was largely limited to people on welfare. By 1990, federal law mandated that all states provide Medicaid to pregnant women and children under six with incomes up to one and a third times the poverty line, and that they phase in coverage for children six through 18 with incomes up to 100% of the poverty line. That extended coverage to millions of children. In the case of SNAP, by 1990, average benefits were about 10% higher than when Ronald Reagan took office. There were big deficit reduction laws passed in 1990 and in 1993, but those laws expanded SNAP and the EITC further. They didn't cut targeted programs, they did cut the Universal Medicare program, mainly by reducing payments to providers. Congress in those years used savings from cutting Medicare to help finance expansions in Medicaid. Now, the political pendulum then swung in the other direction. The 1996 welfare law did contain substantial cuts in SNAP, also in Medicaid. But once again, those programs more than bounced back. Within a few years, SNAP and Medicaid began expanding again through both legislative and administrative action. And today, both programs serve a broader set of beneficiaries overall than before the Reagan cuts and before the welfare law. And policymakers did cut Social Security. The Social Security reforms of 1983 raised from 65 to 67 the age at which someone can retire and begin to receive full Social Security benefits. Now, that change was phased in over many years. In fact, it first takes full effect for people turning 62 this year in 2022. But for those whom it fully affects, it translates into a 14% across the board benefit reduction, regardless of whether you begin drawing benefits as early as age 62 or as late as age 70. In other words, the monthly benefits that new retirees receive are 14% lower than they would have been if the age for full benefits had stayed at 65. And policymakers also scaled back Social Security in other ways in the early 1980s, such as by eliminating the minimum benefit for new beneficiaries and phasing out benefits for students over 19 or in post-secondary education. Let's also take a quick look at what is called sequestration. Now, this is a procedure Congress first established in 1985 that triggers across the board budget cuts if Congress misses certain budget targets. It's 
not been used very often, but it is noteworthy, I think, that under every law of the past 37 years that established a sequestration procedure as part of that law, under every one of them, policymakers exempted every major targeted program from the across the board cuts and also exempted Social Security, but did not exempt Medicare, federal unemployment benefits, or student loans. The bottom line, the narrative that targeted programs almost inevitably do poorly in the political process and universal programs virtually always do much better is much too simplistic. Let me move now to the second issue. If the targeted universal doesn't explain as much as people have sometimes assumed, what other factors help explain a program's political strength or weakness? Now, I, we don't have time for a comprehensive review, but here are some of the key factors. First, programs with broader eligibility and as a result, broader constituencies tend to do better. The cash welfare programs that have done so badly serve only people well below the poverty line while most of the targeted programs that have grown strongly now extend well beyond people in poverty and often into the middle class. That includes Medicaid, CHIP, the ACA subsidies, the EITC, and the child tax credit. In 2021, the EITC provided benefits to a married couple with two children with income up to about $54,000. In 2020, the Medicaid and CHIP income limit for children was about $71,000 for a family of four in the median state, meaning half the states had higher income limits than that. The ACA subsidies go to families of three with income up to 92,000 now. Family of four, it's over 100,000. And policymakers also broadened and simplified Medicaid and SNAP by eliminating their asset tests or pairing them way back and making them less restrictive. The Affordable Care Act eliminated asset tests altogether in Medicaid, except for people qualifying through its, eligibility, its uh, elderly and disabled eligibility categories. And a large majority of the states have used flexibility that Congress gave them in recent decades to largely or entirely eliminate asset tests and SNAP. By expanding the beneficiaries of these programs, policymakers likely also softened the racial imagery around them. Martin Gillens showed in his book, Why Americans Hate Welfare, that's the title of the book, that cash assistance programs have suffered politically from racism, particularly from racial stereotypes of black female-headed households that all too many policymakers and members of the public still hold about people getting cash welfare aid, that has been a factor in making those programs a prime target for cuts over the years. But other programs have expanded into the middle class and policymakers in the public now likely view them in less racially charged terms. Several decades ago, the eminent Harvard professor Theta Scotchpole argued that targeted programs are inherently weak politically because people with incomes not far above the poverty line who are struggling resent programs that go to people with less income but that they can't get themselves. She has been a proponent of universality and she called for, and I'm quoting here, new policies that could address the needs of less privileged Americans along with those of the middle class and the stable working class, end quote. Well, that is essentially what has happened in recent decades in a number of key programs as they expanded to serve millions of non-poor families, but it's occurred without the programs becoming universal. In 2017, Mark Schmidt, the astute former editor of the American Prospect, tied the evolution of Medicaid from a program largely for people on welfare to one that serves millions of working and moderate income families and enjoys support from hospitals and governors. 
Schmidt tied this evolution to the political strength Medicaid demonstrated in 2017 in the battle over the Affordable Care Act, when strong public support for Medicaid played a central role in defeating the efforts to repeal the ACA. Second, in my list of factors that affect how programs do politically, not surprisingly, programs tied to work do better. Social Security and Medicare require an extensive work history to qualify, and they go mainly to people who are elderly or have disabilities and aren't expected to be working now. The EITC requires earnings, so except in 2021 has the child tax credit. Meanwhile, the programs that have fared the worst, cash welfare assistance and unemployment insurance, go to people who are not currently working, but whom much of the public or views as capable of working. Third, targeted programs that provide benefits in kind or through the tax code do much better than straight cash assistance programs. TANF and its predecessor, Aid to Families with programs, were cut. But although SNAP, food stamps, near cash program, it frees up cash that families can then use for other purposes, yet it has a very different image than a straight cash program, and it has expanded robustly. Years of public opinion research show much greater public support for in-kind assistance that helps people with necessities, like SNAP does with food, than for straight cash aid. There's very important recent research that finds that when people are asked to choose between cash benefits that lower income families can use on anything and a benefit they can use only for necessities, Americans overwhelmingly choose the in-kind benefits and say they are willing to provide considerably more in benefits if the benefits are in-kind. Providing SNAP benefits is food assistance brings another political benefit. It means that the House and Senate Agriculture Committees are the committees that oversee SNAP. They make it part of a farm bill they write every four or five years. Well, most Americans don't work on farms anymore, and the farm bills can't pass without the votes of urban members. Many urban members have made clear that to get their votes for a farm bill, it must treat SNAP decently. SNAP also draws support from the retail food industry, while Medicaid draws support from hospitals and doctors. But cash assistance by its very nature doesn't attract the same kind of secondary constituencies. Now, at this point, some of you may be saying, don't the earned income credit and the child credit come in cash? They do but they come through the tax code rather than through what are seen as straight cash aid spending programs. And persuasive research shows there is much stronger public support for benefits delivered through the tax code than through spending programs. The earned income credit and the child credit also benefit significantly from the trade-offs and extensive log rolling that so often occur when lawmakers write a tax bill. The supporters of those credits have been able to extract expansions in them more than a dozen times since the 1980s. The EITC, the CTC, or both, they've been expanded in bills cutting taxes, in bills rating taxes, in bills leaving the level of revenue roughly the same. In fact, the EITC and CTC expansions and a tax credit for college costs were the only temporary measures of the 2009 stimulus legislation that ultimately were made permanent. Fourth, programs with full federal financing and strong federal rules do better. Social Security, Medicare, SNAP, the EITC, and the child credit all are fully federally funded. They are not dependent on state budget decisions or state politics. When programs do depend on state funding to a great degree, 
And in the case of unemployment insurance, when they depend on state taxes on employers, they face the risk that state policymakers will pare back and restrict the programs as a way to free up money for other issues, tax cuts, helping them balance their budget, or whatever. Federal administration of programs, or at least minimum federal standards for eligibility, benefits, and access, also help protect and strengthen programs. SNAP and Medicaid are state administered, but they have crucially important national standards. In fact, most of the major expansions of Medicaid in recent decades are the result of direct federal mandates or requirements or new standards that it has erected. But cash welfare assistance and unemployment insurance largely lack these features. They are highly decentralized programs that lack strong federal standards while being reliant on the states for a significant share of their funding. Fifth, programs that serve certain groups do better. Not surprisingly, programs for the elderly do the best. Programs for children other than cash welfare assistance do next best. But programs for people who are not elderly or disabled and are not raising children have done the worst, especially programs for working age adults who don't have children and are not employed. Sixth, entitlements which have assured funding do much better than discretionary programs which are funded through the annual appropriations process. Overall federal spending for mandatory programs targeted at Universal Together, as well as other mandatory programs that don't fit into either of those two categories, overall federal spending for mandatory programs grew 154% between 1979 and 2019 after adjusting for inflation and population growth, while spending for non-defense discretionary programs outside of veterans' health care grew 2% over 40 years. Basically, not at all. And that has an impact. Take low-income housing programs. They are discretionary, not mandatory and they reach only about one in every four households eligible for them because that's as far as the money Congress provides in the annual appropriations bills will go. Finally, program expansions with lower costs tend to do better. If policymakers have to pay for program expansions to secure the votes to pass them, or if proposed expansions face resistance on Capitol Hill due to concern about deficits and debt, the lower cost of expansions in targeted programs can enhance their political prospects relative to proposed expansions in universal programs. I think cost is very likely one of the reasons why targeted programs have expanded more in recent decades than universal ones. For the final part of my talk, let me move quickly to two related issues. Poverty reduction and how well programs do in reaching the people eligible for them. On the poverty question, uh, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in a very interesting analysis found that in 1970, government benefits and taxes other than health insurance kept out of poverty only about 9% of those who would otherwise be poor. By 2017, government benefits and taxes kept out of poverty 47% of those who would otherwise be poor. Strong growth in both, social, in both targeted programs and Social Security has been the main factor here. Social Security does more than all other programs combined to keep people 65 or over out of poverty. It lifted 17 million older people out of poverty in 2017. But for people under 65, it is the targeted programs that do the most. They kept 20 million people out of poverty in 2017, which was more than double the number, lifted, the number of people under 65 lifted out of poverty by Social Security and unemployment insurance combined. Targeted programs also do the most to reduce 
racial disparities and poverty rates, although those disparities remain very wide. Could I have the second slide, please? In 2017, targeted programs cut the black poverty rate from 32 to 19. This is from a Congressional Research Service analysis. Targeted programs cut the black poverty rate from 32 to 19 percent, and the Latino poverty rate from 31 percent to 19 percent, while cutting the white poverty rate from 13 to 9 percent. Lastly, how well the programs do in reaching their intended beneficiaries. Another part of this common narrative about targeted and universal programs holds that universal programs reach virtually everybody eligible for them, while targeted programs leave a very large share of the eligibles off to the side and never reach them. But here again, the story is much more complicated than that. That's too simple. A program's take-up rate is the percentage of people eligible for it who actually receive its benefits. Take-up rates vary greatly across social programs. And they vary more among programs within the targeted category and more among programs within the universal category than they vary between the two categories. Unemployment insurance, which is universal, has an estimated take-up rate of only 40 to 70 percent. That's substantially lower than a number of the key targeted programs. The latest estimates for SNAP are that in 2018, an estimated 83 percent of the eligible households were enrolled. Among children eligible for Medicaid or CHIP who aren't otherwise insured, 92 percent were enrolled in those programs in 2019, which is actually a bit higher as a take-up rate than the rate for Medicare's prescription drug benefit. And even those figures paint an incomplete picture because take-up rates don't tell us what share of the eligible benefits people are receiving. We know from extensive academic research, benefit size matters greatly. The bigger the benefit, the higher the take-up rate. Now let's take SNAP. So as I just mentioned, 83% of the eligible households participated in 2018, but they received more than 95% of the benefits that would be provided if everyone who was eligible participated. That's because SNAP's participation rate is very high among those eligible for large benefits and much lower among those at the top of SNAP's income eligibility scale who only get small benefits and generally have less acute need. In targeted programs that phase out their benefits above certain income levels, the percentage of the eligible benefits that families or individuals receive is larger than the percentage of eligible people who are enrolled. The EITC is another example. Its take-up rate overall is estimated at 78%. But there are big differences in the EITC take-up rate for workers without children who are eligible for only small benefits and have a low take-up rate, and the rate for workers with children who get larger benefits. Families with children receive close to 90% of the EITC benefits that would be provided if all eligible families with children enrolled. There's a piece of good news here. The take-up rates in programs like SNAP and Medicaid are actually much higher now than they were a few decades ago. And that's largely because of changes made in the programs over the last 20 or 25 years that improved access and reduced the burdens people face in applying and remaining enrolled. In both programs, through legislative and administrative actions, policymakers reduced how often participating households must have their eligibility redetermined. They eased requirements for people to go to state or county offices to apply. They reduced and simplified reporting requirements on recipients. They greatly expanded the ways that people can apply online. And they began using information technology to a greater degree to verify income and other household circumstances by tapping into databases like social security or wage databases instead of requiring applicants to come to offices and produce so many documents. 
In addition, programs like Medicaid and school lunches have begun use, using what's called auto-enrollment, in which enrollment in one program can be used to determine that someone is eligible for another program and enroll them automatically or with minimal burden. And that has proven very effective in raising take-up rates. Now, I, I want to be clear. I don't want to be a Pollyanna here. Even with this progress, we have a long way to go. There are still millions of people who are eligible for various benefits. They qualify for them and don't receive them. But two recent developments hold promise for further progress. The bipartisan infrastructure bill passed last fall had $65 billion in it to expand broadband in local communities, particularly by improving internet access and making it more affordable for low-income and rural households. And that should help boost take up in social programs as the programs come to rely increasingly on online interactions. Second, in December, President Biden issued a very detailed executive order that directs federal agencies to take strong actions to reduce application and enrollment burdens in social programs and to increase take-up rates. Donald Moynihan and Pamela Hurd of Georgetown University, uh, leading academic experts on such burdens, have called the Biden executive order, quote, a huge sea change. And I'll use that positive note to round up my remarks. Jason is coming up to the stage, and we're going to have a discussion of some of the policy implications and then go to questions. Um, Bob, so that was just a masterpiece of decades of wisdom, thinking, and incredibly hard work. Um, your hand was in a lot of the programs that you talked about, and you didn't tell us your role in every one of them because that would have taken us months um, and months. Uh, you were telling us about the past and an analysis of the past, that if anything, targeted programs do a little bit better than universal programs, but then there's a lot of heterogeneity within them. When you draw on that experience, those lessons, you know, what are the policy lessons now? What should be the priorities for policymakers going forward? Well, in terms of the targeted universal, uh, we now have a mix of targeted and universal programs. We're going to need to continue to have a mix of targeted and universal programs. You can make the argument that, despite the things that I said, that sure, universal programs do have some advantages. The issue with universal programs, I think, is they cost a lot more. And if you're in a country that has the kind of resistance to raising taxes that we do in the United States, it makes it really hard to go f much farther in a universal program direction. I mean, you compare us to Western Europe. So most Western European countries, they have more universality than we do but they also raise lots more revenue from middle-class households as well as the wealthy and corporations through things like value-added taxes. So if you look at the OECD data, most Western European countries raise revenue from all levels of government that equals between 38 and 47 percent of GDP. The UK is 33 percent, Canada is 34 percent. Where are we? 25% from all levels of government combined in 2019. And Jason, as you mentioned to me when we were talking recently, there are no examples of countries going much farther in a universal program direction without raising substantially more in tax revenue than we do. I, I also think we're heading towards an interesting challenge with Social Security and Medicare hospital insurance, right? They're, they both have insolvency approaching. Policymakers can't let that happen. They're going to have to work out something. That something is probably, you would think, going to entail as one piece of whatever they do, some raising of payroll tax rates for Social Security and Medicare. That would entail middle class tax increases. Then think about, okay, do we really think 
that we could raise payroll tax rate. Politically, you could, Congress will raise payroll tax rates for Social Security and Medicare, and then raise substantial additional taxes on the middle class on top of that to go much farther in a universal program direction. So we have a mix now. I think we're going to keep a mix. We're going to need to do that. And you know, there's one other kind of obvious point, but worth keeping in mind. If you have a fixed amount of federal revenue, for a fixed amount of revenue, you can provide substantially more support to low and modest income people who need it most through a targeted approach, because a universal approach, if it's the same amount of money, will be spreading it thinly over the entire population. Um, but I do think, I know we're going to get into this, that there are some crucial things we need to do ahead, particularly in programs like the Child Tax Credit and others. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about Build Back Better. It was the most significant social legislation debate we've had in 12 years. The name Build Back Better is now gone. The debate itself is on the back burner. It has a prayer of coming back. I certainly hope it comes back. There was a really strong articulation from a lot of Democrats about the need for that to be universal programs, something that they seem to accept what you were rejecting, this idea that a program for the poor is a poor program. Does that mean Democrats, you think, aren't accepting your analysis? Is there some lesson that you might want to change based on the Build Back Better experience from I what you were saying? Well, I think the Build Back Better experience shows a real gap between how a lot of policymakers talk and what they do when they face hard realities and they have to put the legislation together. I'll give an example. Last August, September, when the work was starting on a Build Back Better bill, people had high hopes, first for a 3.5 trillion bill, then a 2.2 trillion bill. There was a competition on Capitol Hill among Democrats. There was a competition for what should be the health care priorities in that bill. On one side, calls for a universal Medicare dental hearing and vision benefit. On the other side, wasn't that people didn't think that was a good idea, but they thought the higher priority should be expansions of targeted health insurance programs to close the Medicaid coverage gap. You know, there are 12 states that still haven't taken the ACA's Medicaid expansion, millions of people below the poverty line in those states who are uninsured, closing the Medicaid coverage gap, and strengthening the subsidies under the Affordable Care Act so that more moderate income people could afford insurance. What happened? In every iteration of the Build Back Better bill, the Medicare benefit was missing and the two targeted healthcare expansions were both in. In fact, I haven't given up hope that in the next couple of months, there might still be a negotiated agreement with Joe Manchin, there might still be a bill, and if there is, there's actually a chance that it could include both of those two targeted benefits. So why did the two targeted benefits go in and the Medicare benefit, despite all the discussion about it, did not? The main reason was cost. The Medicare benefit would have cost substantially more than the targeted expansions combined. And then there were two other factors. I think people began to realize that the main effect of the targeted expansions would be to enable some millions of people of limited means who were now uninsured to gain insurance, whereas what the Medicare benefit would do would be to enable millions of people who have insurance to improve the coverage. And there was another factor, particularly important for people like Congressman Clyburn. The targeted expansions would do much more to close the racial disparities, the racial inequity in health coverage in this country than the Medicare proposal would. So when it started out, with all of the discussion on the Hill, you might have guessed the targeted expansions aren't going to make it, it's going to be the Medicare expansion, and what happened was the reverse. Great. So I want to get to the audience as soon as possible. I have one more question. I'm hoping I could get a quick answer, but people could go, there's four different microphones. 
Um, you can head to one of them if you have a question, start thinking about your question. But wanted to, in Build Back Better, just drill down on the child tax credit, and especially the full refundability, the idea that you get the entire amount whether or not you are working. I couldn't tell whether your analysis says that that's doomed and will never happen, or you saw a path for it. Um, so just quickly, while people are formulating uh, I, questions. To me, maybe the single most important next step in strengthening U.S. social programs would be to make the child tax credit fully refundable. That is, so that children and families with little or no earnings get it too. You know, here we are today, millions of children in six-figure income families get the full child tax credit of $2,000 a year, while one-third of all children in the country, half of all black children, half of all Latino children, 70% of children and families headed by a single female parent get no credit at all or only a partial credit because their families don't have earnings or earn too little. And I have hope that that's going to change. I mean, it changed clearly for 2021 under the American Rescue Plan, but the Rescue Plan provisions have expired. But despite that, look at the history here. When the child credit was first created in 1997, it was limited to people that earned enough to owe federal income tax. That changed in 2001, when the credit was made to start phasing in once a family's earnings surpassed $10,000. Between 2001 and 2017, that was lowered. Now, the credit begins phasing in when a family's earnings pass $2,500. In 2021, there was no earnings requirement at all. So this history gives me hope that if we stick to it, if people who f favor this remain engaged, that we will ultimately get there. Now, somebody was asking me the other day, wait a minute, you've explained how cash spending programs for people with no earnings have done so badly. Does that doom full refundability in the child tax credit? I don't think it does, because the child tax credit, I'm going back in my talk to those factors, the child tax credit has a number of factors that make for political strength. It's delivered through the tax code. As I mentioned, there have been something like 14 separate pieces of legislation enacted into law since the early mid-80s that expanded the EITC, the CTC, or both. Second, unlike cash welfare, the child credit serves tens of millions of middle-income kids alongside lower-income kids. Thirdly, it's fully federally funded. All the rules are federal. States can't play any role in trimming it back. And something that I think is already important and may become more important in the years to come, uh, the child credit is extremely effective in reducing child poverty. There is now growing academic research that it's also extremely important in improving children's life chances, which could mean more productive workers when they grow up. So um, I really think there is a really good chance here, maybe not this year, an outside, outside, outside chance for a uh, scaled back, build back, better bill. But, and it may take another democratic trifecta simultaneous control of White House, House, and Senate. But if it doesn't happen this year and Republicans take back the House in November, I do think that if people who regard this as extremely high priority remain engaged, that when the next Democratic trifecta comes, that there would be a good chance of getting full refundability in the child credit, which you know, if you do the child tax credit reforms on a permanent basis that were in the American Rescue Plan, that alone reduces child poverty in the United States by 30 to 40 percent in one fell swoop. Great. That's exciting to hear. Um, we are going to have people do questions. Um, identify yourself, ask a question, um, and make it a short question. We'll start with you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a first year Masters of Public Policy student here. Uh, to your right. <laughs> oh, right, right there, right there. Oh, <laughs> I'm up a level. Yeah, here at the Kennedy School. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is regarding the expanded social safety net policies that occurred during COVID. So I'm thinking about policies like the expanded CTC, 
um, the expansion of unemployment insurance, the economic impact payment. And I'm curious if you think that, I'm curious how you think about whether those programs affected the way policymakers or Americans more broadly view the social safety net. Sorry, I didn't catch the final sentence. How do you think it affected the way people thought about the social safety net, all the different things that were done in the CARES Act, like the stimulus checks, the UI expansions? I'm not sure we clearly know the answer to that yet. I know there were people who thought, oh, look at these stimulus checks. Okay, we'll just continue them well into the future. Uh, that didn't occur. While they weren't as big, there were stimulus payments sent to much of the population in the last recession as well. Uh, I'm not sure what change that makes. What I'm more interested, what I'm particularly interested in, and I'm not sure where things go here, is unemployment insurance. So this odd duality, as I mentioned in my talk, Unemployment insurance has not fared well over recent decades. But I should probably qualify that and say it has not fared well outside of recessions. And in recessions, we expand UI. And in this recession, we dramatically expanded UI. It, it almost became like a different program. How to think about that? I think the key point is that the only reason the big UI expansions happened during the pandemic and recession was that the federal government fully financed them and mandated them. Otherwise, they would not have occurred. So that leads to the conclusion to me that if you want to strengthen unemployment insurance for the long term and make it more adequate, we're going to need substantially greater federalization of its finances and its rules. But that's hard politically. That would entail substantial federal budgetary cost. It would likely encounter opposition from some powerful stakeholders. So I'm, I'm, I struggle with this. I'm not sure what the answer is. To, to me, the pandemic and the recession demonstrated how unemployment insurance could be a much more effective, valuable program. But those expansions ended, and UI experts I talk to think that we'll probably, over the coming decade, go back to some more states cutting it more, particularly under pressure from employers. So that, that, that's a real challenge. I, I think, just to tie this to your last question, I think the politics of transforming Unemployment insurance on a permanent basis, even though it's a universal program, are harder than the politics of making the child tax credit fully refundable. Great. Now, can we go to 705 with a hard stop? Okay, great. Um, but would love to get as many of these questions in as possible. So we'll do quick questions and in so I'll far try as and the, do it's possible answers. to do a quick answer. Yeah. I don't know who is first over there. So. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Greenstein. Thank you so much for coming. It's an honor to have you here. My name is Chuck Bell. I'm a master's uh, mid-career student at the Kennedy School. I'm also a Navy Reserve officer. Um, the United uh, Negro College Fund said a mine is a terrible thing to waste. Um, so we value education, but we don't incentivize it you know, for those who really need it. Um, how do we cancel student loans or you know, make public college free? Um, it just seems like we're in a, an existential crisis, but we're not addressing it. The student loan debate is a hot one, and I must say, my years at the Center on Budget and, and now at, at Brookings, I've never really worked on student loans. Um, I'm really skeptical about simply canceling all debt. Um, it, it seems to me, and I, I say this with some trepidation, because I really don't I know this area like I know refundable tax credits or Medicaid or SNAP. It, it seems to me that we should greatly strengthen Pell Grants. And in the student loan area, and I'm, there are probably a lot of people in the audience who know this better than I, in theory, 
it ought to be the case that as long as people have low or modest incomes, they don't have to repay that much of the loan. And in theory, that's kind of how the program is supposed to work, but the income contingent part of student loan payments, as I understand it, just doesn't work very well. So looking forward, I'm not sure what exactly, clearly there is some debt relief that is needed. I think eliminating all student debt at all income levels would pose problems on multiple fronts. I'm not sure exactly where you go there. But in the other area, we've got to find a way to make the student loans work in a different fashion so that people who don't have resources or much in resources aren't pay, faced with loan debt they can't repay. And for starters, the Pell Grants ought to be much more adequate. I don't know the numbers in my head, maybe you do, Jason, but I've seen these figures on what percentage of uh, the average college tuition uh, a Pell Grant equals, and they're much lower now than they were several decades ago. That was clearly a, a move in the wrong direction. Great. I just think whatever David Deming tells me to think on this topic. Uh, next question. But I think, I, I think that, unless David Deming tells me other ones. Hi, um, my name is Gabby. I'm a first year master's MPP student. Um, and I was thinking about what you were saying about what it means for programs to like do better. And I get the purpose of this talk was more about how programs succeed in the political sphere, but it feels like a lot of the like metrics that you called out, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, like are really guided by like I don't, racism. And I guess I'm just wondering like what you kind of touched on, but I'm wondering if you think that like we just need to be thinking about like what it means for programs to like do better in a different way and like if so how you kind of reshape that or like inform that conversation differently because yeah it just feels like yeah guided by well, some other I, stuff. I, I think <laughs> doing better means a number of things. Um, in places where the benefits aren't adequate it means having stronger benefits. Um, brief side note. I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention than it did. Um, but when people look back on the last two Biden years, one of the things that's really going to stand out is the Biden administrative action last summer that raised the maximum SNAP benefit 21%. That's an increase in average SNAP benefits of 27%. That was really big. Um, Benefit adequacy, where there are what I would view, of, view as unwarranted or excessive restrictions in programs. I'd like to see them removed. So as I noted, SNAP and Medicaid overall are more expansive in their eligibility than they used to be, but not in every case. Some of the restrictions on eligibility for immigrants who are here lawfully that were enacted in the 96 welfare law are still on the books. For me, doing better in that area would be removing them. Doing better, I think, also means, as my remarks implied, coming as close to 100% as you can and reaching the people who were eligible for them. I'm less concerned if someone at the top of the SNAP income scale who's eligible for only $20 a month doesn't do it. But where we're talking about significant benefits, you, you want to do better. And that also is integrally tied to reducing the burdens and the hassle that people have to go through in applying and remaining enrolled. As I indicated, major progress has been made there more than is often recognized. But there's still a substantial way to go on that front. And the hope is, as we move farther into information technology advances, can we reduce those burdens and that hassle more? So I think doing better covers a variety of fronts. And needless to say, where a program is valuable and effective, doing better also fundamentally includes not cutting it. So I think the story of the last several decades in these programs is not one of simply straight, uniform, uninterrupted expansion. What it's really been is, uh, in SNAP and Medicaid and programs like that, you take two steps forward 
The political pendulum changes. You gird your loins and you fight off cuts. Or maybe you have some cuts, but they're just a little, and you prepare for when the pendulum swings back to get a further advance. The story of the last 30, 40 years in targeted programs has been kind of two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, a half a step back. Keeping at it, not getting discouraged, keeping pushing on a number of fronts. Doing better means doing better on a number of fronts. Great. We have two questions and one minute for each question up there. I'll try to be quick. Um, thank you. My name's Alex. I'm a first year MPA student here at Kennedy. Um, I was surprised by your findings about the, and, and interested in your findings about the growth of targeted programs relative to universal programs. Um, as a student of public administration, not just policy, one of the things that I think is interesting and appealing about universal programs is the relative ease of administration of them. And as someone who's going through tax season myself and has been consuming a lot of content about what makes filing taxes hard, oftentimes many of these targeted programs that you describe that are administered through the tax code are challenging for people to know how to access. And, and frequently there's probably people who don't have the same level of uptake that they might because they don't know exactly how to access them. And I, so I guess my question is, how do we balance, and, and this may not be your area of expertise, but how do we balance our goal of making sure people are getting the aid that they're entitled to through these targeted programs while not making it so onerous with targeted programs that, that people are actually cut off from, from these intended benefits? Yeah, this is a great question. And I, I would note, too, um, when you compare targeted and universal programs here, you have to distinguish the targeted universal dimension from another dimension, the following. Social Security, Medicare, and UI, since they're based all on people's earnings records, the eligibility unit is the individual. In most targeted programs, the eligibility unit is in family or household. And that creates complexity in determining who is the member of the family or household. If you were to set up universal programs that weren't based on individuals' earnings records, the universal programs might have the, exactly the same issues. If you made the child tax credit universal, you'd still have the struggle over which person, which parent, which tax filer gets the credit. In terms of simplifying it if it's through the tax code, um, one thing I didn't initially realize that was really interesting is what the Biden administration and the Internal Revenue Service did last year. Remember when there were monthly child tax credit payments for six months? So what about all the people who hadn't filed a tax return and IRS didn't have their records? So the IRS set up this online portal. And in the online portal, you didn't have to provide any information about your income at all. There was a question. It said, if your income is over the following levels, which are the levels that under federal law, if your income exceeds, you're required by law to file a tax return. It said, if you're over this income level, you can't use the portal. If your income is below the income level, you can. And it didn't require any more income information than that. Um, so I, I think there are way, now, of course, there was still the issue that people had to learn that there was this portal. And uh, my um, uh, former colleagues at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, for example, um, had this great idea, which uh, people on the Hill in the administration, I think, thought they would need more time than they had last year to implement. But the idea was, you know, you could work with states to screen their electronically their Medicaid and SNAP caseloads. And, and then work with the IRS to merge them against tax filing records, identify children that were on SNAP or Medicaid, but their families didn't file a tax return, they weren't claimed as dependents, and reach them that way. There are things you could do with Social Security Administration databases. So I, I think part of the answer on this in targeted programs really comes back to making much heavier use of information technology and other databases to try to identify people and come as close as you can to either automatically enroll them or, for example, when the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion was being expanded. Okay, I'm going to get 
dragged off the stage by I'll, the I'll dean. do one sentence. There was a, a, a states could screen their SNAP caseloads, file, find people who looked like they were eligible for Medicaid, enroll them almost automatically. They would send the family something where you just had to do a check or something very simple, didn't have to learn on your own, and then you got enrolled. We need more of that going into the future. Um, great. Well, unfortunately, we have no uh, time for any more questions, but just a spectacular combination of both a big picture understanding and getting really into the details of those budget and policy priorities that you've devoted your life to. So thank you for sharing that with us, Paul. <laughs> I think so, yeah.